Watch this. As of last week, more than 95,000 Idahoans have filed for first-time unemployment benefits since Governor Brad Little declared a state of emergency in the fight against COVID-19. It's been about five weeks, and that's more people in just those five weeks than all of last year. In fact, 60% more. Five weeks versus one whole year. So you can imagine how overwhelmed Idaho's Department of Labor has been during this time in handling all those unemployment claims. Does that mean that every one of those 95,000 or so people have gotten their unemployment checks? No. If you have a question or a unique situation to satisfy on your claim, you have to call the office and wait on the phone. It's a common question these days that they're getting is, where is my extra $600, by the way, in my unemployment payment as promised by the federal government? Another question, how long do I need to wait on hold with the Department of Labor before I get to talk to someone on the phone? Joe Paris got some answers. Within the last four weeks, we've had as many claims as we did in the entire year of 2019. There are a lot of claims and a lot of questions for the Idaho Department of Labor as they process a lot of unemployment requests. But we did have to add additional phone lines, additional servers, just so that we could simply handle the amount of phone calls that we were getting. Leah Reeder with the Department of Labor says there is a common question Idahoans want an answer to. Right now, my biggest frustration is not being able to get answers as to when the CARES package help will actually be available to those of us on unemployment. Katie Crow lives in Boise. She filed for unemployment a few weeks back, and like others, she's now asking about the extra $600 a week for unemployment that the president signed off on a few weeks ago as part of the CARES Act. It would make a huge world of difference um, being able to pay bills. So when should Katie expect the CARES Act payment? For sure within the next few weeks. The next few um, weeks. I feel confident saying that. Why the wait? Well, the state of Idaho had to integrate the federal CARES Act guidance into their state system. Yeah, it has taken some time to program them into the system. And all states are kind of in the same boat. Katie also brings up another common issue. The hold times are very long which is understandable, but it, it's very difficult for somebody trying to get answers with them. Yeah, we've had such an increase in calls, as you can imagine. So there is a wait, a wait time. Um, it can be 30 to 40 minutes before they get through. Reader says they are seeing people call in to simply ask if they can file a claim. You don't have to talk to us first. You can just go online and then the system is going to ask like relevant questions to help determine if you'll be eligible for benefits. If you do qualify for unemployment, it will take some time to get your first payment. Reader has this tip to help speed it up. We recommend direct deposit only because your first payment's going to be faster because they don't have to physically send you the debit card. Reader says it's all hands on deck right now. Even former employees are coming back to help process claims. She adds that through all the frustration, many Idahoans like Katie have also treated this process with respect and patience. They are probably faced with the hardest time that they've ever had in their careers as well and very kind and compassionate and, and helpful. You know, every week we learn, we get better, we learn how to do things better and faster. Um, but yeah, I, I'm, I am really impressed with just how fully committed everybody within the agency is to getting people these benefits. What else has been impressive, impressive is how fast this has happened. We've gotten to 95,000 people in just a short amount of time. So Joe, what other resources though can unemployed people use at this time? Right, there's all kinds of uh, resources that the state of Idaho, the Department of Label, uh, Labor is pushing towards uh, food banks, community resources across the state, not just Ada County, not just the Treasure Valley. We're having those all in a link on this story at KTVB.com. The Department of Labor understands that sometimes it's going to take some time for you to get that money, for you to get that unemployment check. So in the meantime, they have set up a whole resource page. If you need food, if you need anything else, they've set it up. You can go check it out, KTVB.com. Brian, something else they really want people to keep an eye on is really that patience. They know that a lot of people are frustrated right now. They tell me they're doing their best. All right, thanks, Joe. You know, the frustrations about the economy and the concern of government overreach, part of what led to this protest last Friday in front of the Idaho State House. Idaho Freedom Foundation helped organize the Disobey Idaho protest, saying the time for disobedience is now. 
with too many small businesses on the verge of collapse. Some may call this group the vocal minority, but their opinions are shared by many, including some of our own politicians, like Lieutenant Governor Janice McGeehan, who wrote a letter to Governor Little on Friday urging him to commit to fully reopening our state no later than May 1st. McGeehan says she agrees that, quote, we need to do all that we can to protect our frontline workers, end quote, but goes on to say, I have never been supportive of forced closures as such closures are economically devastating and have already caused some businesses to shutter for good. This is the time for bold and decisive leadership, she went on. Idahoans have been plagued with uncertainty and ambiguity, ambiguity, excuse me, for too long. And now we have, or we need, I should say, decisions and dates on which we can rely. Well, we reached out to governor, the governor and lieutenant governor for both of them to give us some comment on this. We heard back from lieutenant governor. She declined our interview request, saying her time is fully occupied working for the people of Idaho, but she reiterated her stance, telling us that protecting the health and safety of Idahoans does not require continuing to sabotage our economy. Some businesses aren't waiting until that May 1st deadline that McGeehan put out there for guidance on how to possibly reopen. They're reopening now, but their decision begs us to explore the question more. When do civil liberties and the economy become priority over public health? The old, does your liberty to swing your fist end at my face debate. Are they mutually exclusive or can we have both equally? Kim Fields picks up the story from there. Slick's Bar in Nampa sits shuttered right now, but come Saturday, they'll be back open for business, selling drinks out of a catering truck in their outdoor beer garden. Owner Sheila Sartorius says it's a matter of livelihood. We have you know, put everything we have into this business. We are a small family business, so I have a daughter that works for me. I have a son that works for me. And everybody else that also works there is, um, you know, friends of the family. We are all out of work right now. And a matter of what she believes to be government overreach. The numbers aren't there to support what they're doing to this nation. I mean, we have shut in billions of healthy people and the numbers just aren't there to support it. I mean, you don't stop the living because of what's what's happening right now. When you made the decision to reopen, are you thinking of the death toll and, and the healthcare workers? Before you called me, I reached out to one of my good friends who is a healthcare worker. She's a 30 year plus ER nurse that is planning on attending on Saturday. I mean, when you look at the state of Idaho, these these healthcare workers are getting sent home early. They're not they're the they're not overworked and being ran ragged like the, the media plays it out. It's a media ploy in, in our minds. I mean, I guess I understand people are dying, but this is hyped up so much by the media that it has caused the hysteria. And we believe if you live life out of fear, you stop living. This isn't us attacking humankind and not, not being sympathetic or having empathy for people who are coming down with this. During this, I know we took part in the um, Hear the Love at the hospital last Thursday. And it was amazing to go out there. And, you know, I felt so grateful at the fact that the community that showed up out there, which was predominantly the biker community, was hugging each other and, you know, laughing, and it felt normal. And it, I told my husband when we left there, it felt so good to just feel normal for a, for a, a period of time. That is yeah, what I've, this last two weeks have done to people. We don't, we're out of sorts. What about defying the governor's stay-at-home order? But if you look at what the governor said the other day, there was reopening of non-essential businesses. I mean, how is it that people can go to a publicly owned, a, a city owned golf course, pay green fees and gather there, but I can't open up my business and expect people to conduct themselves in the same manner. Tony Robbins says, you don't get anything without massive action. And this is our massive action. We can't sit back and watch people take, if we can't, we can't complain about what's going on to us if we're not willing to take massive action. And, and this, this is our massive action and hopefully others follow suit. Well, Shirley, Sheila, excuse me, clearly upset about the half open, half closed, slow rollout of our reopening the economy. We asked Governor Little for a response to businesses defying his order and his office did not respond. Idaho Code says violating a stay at home order could be a misdemeanor. Boise police told us if absolutely necessary, they could cite someone. Meridian police told us their goal is to educate unless someone isn't a quick learner, then they would consider the next step. Nampa police, by the way, did not respond to our question. 
Well, we have had a couple of instances, instances though, of this being enforced, this stay at home order. Both, both of them happening in North Idaho. Last Friday, Rathrum police cited a family for trying to hold a yard sale after being warned not to do that twice. Police gave them a copy of the stay at home order and explained a yard sale, not an essential business. Craigslist is still an option though. And earlier this month, the Kootenai County Sheriff's Office cited several people after finding 25 to 30 revelers just gathered at a late night house party. A clear violation of the stay at home order, considering they likely don't all live there. But that would be the first of any enforcement of the governor's stay at home order or essential business only order that we've had confirmed. In fact, we've had several law enforcement agencies tell us unsolicited that they would not be enforcing the governor's order. Yet a large group gathered Friday, as we showed you earlier, to protest that order, saying it violated our liberties and constitutional rights. So I thought it would be a good question to ask on Twitter this week. If you take employment out of the equation, what rights have been taken away from you? What have you not been able to do because of Idaho's COVID-19 crisis mitigation efforts? We also posted this question on our Facebook group earlier this afternoon, got several responses. Jana Martin posted this is my daughter's senior year and has taken away her ability to learn face to face her senior banquet times with friends and possibly her graduation ceremony. It's taken away my ability to make money, so it's taken away my financial security and again also taken away my faith in humanity because people are so eager to bash each other if they have different views on this virus. And this one from Clint Anderson inconvenience not necessarily oppression. Civic responsibility is not a loss of freedom. The most common response I heard was the freedom to assemble. That was taken away from us. But if we can assemble through Zoom or WebEx or FaceTime or whatever online platform you choose, has our right actually been rescinded? And what about that big assembly that took place at the State House last Friday? Was that not allowed to happen? Were there any citations issued there? Anyone arrested? Well, we want to know what you think. Text us your thoughts to that number. This one right here, it's on our screen. 208-321-5614. Be sure to include your name because we're going to read some of these coming up later in the show. Nearly a month into Idaho's stay at home order. Where do we stand when it comes to flattening the curve of COVID-19? Well, at least six feet apart, right? We're gonna check in with St. Luke's Chief Medical Officer. And we wanna hear from you, whether it's a question, a comment about today's show, or maybe just a picture of your dog. Actually, please don't text us a picture of your dog, but just let us know your thoughts. 208-321-5614. Make sure to include your name in the hashtag, the 208. We're gonna read some of your responses at the end of the show.
With nine days left in a five week stay at home order, we wanted to see medically where we stand and how we've handled this virus crisis. The state's COVID-19 website reports we've tested about 17,500 Idahoans for coronavirus. About 10% have come back positive. Now those numbers are from earlier today. That actual infectious rate in Idaho is likely a lot higher though because of asymptomatic people not getting tested. So Dr. James Souza didn't exactly go out on a limb when he told us today we're not testing enough for COVID-19. Dr. Souza is a pulmonary disease specialist with a degree in cell biology, and he's also the chief medical officer for St. Luke's Health Systems. They serve 20 communities from Baker City to Burley, including Blaine County, where for a brief moment, it was one of the hottest spots for coronavirus in the country. Right now, they're keeping track of patients, confirmed cases, ICU and ventilator needs, personal protective equipment and staffing in the St. Luke's health system. Here's how Dr. Souza says St. Luke's and the state are doing. Inside our health system, we are seeing our inpatient numbers go down. Two to three weeks ago, we had 90 to 100 patients in our facility on any given day who either had COVID or were being ruled out for COVID. Uh, that's now down in the high 20s and low 30s, right? So that, that's good. We're still diagnosing cases, but the rate at which we're diagnosing cases is going down. We're also seeing the number of patients with COVID who are in an intensive care unit site of care also uh, coming down. Uh, I, I think today we had uh, seven or eight ICU patients across our health system with a COVID diagnosis. Contrast that with two to three weeks ago where we had uh, about 22, 23. Have you heard anything out there, seen anything on TV, rumors or otherwise, that is just completely inaccurate? First of all, relative to patient safety, you know, uh, you know, high dosing on uh, hydroxychloroquine or, or using, you know, uh, bleach gargles to cure your throat. I mean, th there's just a lot of bad information that's out there that, that's not safe. I've also heard that this is just like the flu. That's just wrong. This is 50 times more lethal than the flu. It's just wrong. I've heard that, uh, um, you know, that the reason that we're, we're in good shape here in Idaho is because we didn't actually have to take the steps that the governor took. Uh, that, that's wrong. We were, we were starting to manage an actual spike in, in one of our regions in Twin Falls. You know, there was the outbreak that occurred in Blaine County, and the vast majority of those folks who needed hospitalization went to uh, Twin Falls. And over a period of five to seven days, we saw our intensive care unit uh, you know, basically uh, at capacity. The reason we're doing okay now is because of the, you know, the action that was taken. And while it, it was kind of a blunt instrument, it worked. And fortunately, it's given us the time now to plan and come up with a, a way to reopen that, that's, that's going to be um, armed with intelligence. You mentioned herd immunity. Is that the ultimate goal here? Yes, I, I think it would be. Whether whether that herd immunity is um, acquired naturally because the infection continues to spread or ideally uh, we're able to control it for long enough that we get an effective vaccine that then we, we'd be able to leverage to, if you will, artificially create that herd immunity uh, through a vaccination program. How quickly can that happen? Well, in terms of a vaccine, I think being realistic, it's not till 2021. Which means that for the next year, we need to be thinking, all of us, about how we uh, live with COVID-19 being in our communities, and, and we can. It's just a virus. <laughs> We've got know-how that we can apply to managing this virus. And just like any other virus, Dr. Souza says, there isn't a healthcare worker that believes flattening the curve will bring COVID cases down to zero. It's about monitoring it, responding to flare-ups and tamping them down until we get that vaccine and get that herd immunity. And that may mean locking down an area that sees another abundance of cases. But that, as you heard him say, could go well into next year. All right, don't forget, we wanna hear your thoughts. What rights 
if any, do you believe have been taken away from you because of the coronavirus mitigation? Aside from employment, or have any rights been taken away at all? Text us at the number that's on your screen, 208-321-5614. Be sure to include your name. We're going to read some of them as we get a little bit later in the show. Bree Eggers up next with your forecast.
All right, so earlier in the, in the show, we asked for your thoughts, any of your thoughts, on your inalienable rights being taken away because of the crisis mitigation surrounding the coronavirus. Getting a lot of responses from all sides, a lot of them just like this. Darwinism, the ability to adapt and survive. Tired of all the businesses crying, I'm supporting several businesses that have adapted and moved their operations online, thinking outside the box to survive. We will never go back to the old ways. This is the new normal, so change. Businesses willing to ignore the stay, home, stay at home order, are they willing to accept the responsibility if someone gets infected at their business? It's a good question, Dan. That's one worth exploring later on. Brian, what about life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness? I assume your pursuit of happiness, life, and liberty ends kind of at my front door. Is that correct? So whatever you do should not have to affect me. Social events for students and their parents are not civil rights. Unfortunate loss, maybe. Our rights extend only when they don't cause others or cause others to lose their rights to safety and health. That's from Kathy. My name is Derry Hawker. In my opinion, we should take a look at South Dakota. I know the people in South Dakota are not any smarter, or more responsible than Idaho residents. OK, we can open back up and be responsible about ourselves at the same time. Tired of liberal media dictating our rights. Well, Derry, don't know that the liberal media, if you're including the 208 in that, don't think we're the ones dictating your rights. You might want to take that up with the governor. We'll be right back. All right, we don't normally do this on the 208, but we're going to continue with more look, uh, more looks, I should say, at your comments you sent in during the show, including this one from Debbie Strang. Our rights to go to any business, such as restaurants, hair salons, department stores, and etc. You could still go to a restaurant, am I right? You just can't sit inside, but you could still get food from a restaurant. Is that correct? If people are afraid of getting sick, stay home. If you want to take a risk, that is a person's freedom to choose. Unless, Debbie, of course, you're choosing to carry that virus into somebody who is immunocompromised. Freedom is a double-edged sword, correct? Sometimes you have to give up some freedom to save yourself and possibly others. Just being honest, I don't feel like my rights have been taken away. It's common sense. We're learning from other countries that have been through this until we get a vaccine. That one from Jason. I do not feel that any rights have been taken away. I do not have the right to take away someone else's right to remain healthy. 
that is sent in from Pat Brownfield, and that's uh, kind of what a lot of people are saying. I feel like to stay at home from the coronavirus is taking my social enjoyment with other people away and smiling at people too because places want you to wear a mask and you can't show your smile behind a mask. Stay at home, taken social away from us too. But yes, is that a fundamental right that has been taken away from us? More inconvenience than anything else. I'm following the self-isolation mandates for civic safety, not because it's mandatory. Luckily, my housemate is too. We'll see you tomorrow.